What's happening, everybody? It's Sean with Reactions to the Classics, and today I'm going to rank every single song from worst to best on Bruce Springsteen's epic Born to Run. I'm going through his entire discography. I'm going to rank the discography at the end. I'm going to rank every song from worst to best at the end, but as I'm doing it, I thought, you know what? Let's just throw up song rankings. It's not going to be hard on his first few albums. I already got two. I already got Greetings from Asbury Park and The Wild, The Innocent and the E Street Shuffle up on the channel. It's not hard on these first ones because there's not a ton of songs. Born to Run only has eight songs, but uh, I know this album quite well. As you can see over my shoulder, I think a uh, highway of this album. It's one of my favorite albums of all time. Springsteen's my favorite solo artist of all time. Big stories behind this. We have album reviews and reactions up to a ton of his albums. So check that out in the playlist below. Also the rankings as I do them for each album will be down there. But if you want to know the whole story behind Born to Run, I suggest you watch that that Trey and I did in the early days of the channel. I think it was the second video we ever shot on this channel. We have over 2,000 of them now. So just keep that in mind when you watch the production value. Not quite as high, but still a great review because it's a great, great album. A lot of stuff going on here. So Bruce had signed with Columbia Records or CBS Records. The guy who signed him, John Hammond, and the record label head, Clive Davis, have left. They left before the last album before uh, The Wild, The Innocent, and The E Street Shuffle. So now we get to his third album. His two previous albums, great critical acclaim, basically no sales. So Columbia Records comes to him and says, we're going to give you more money. We're going to give you a lot of money to record this album, but this is it. It's the last album you have on your deal, and we're not uh, going to sign you again. So you got it. So it's make or break for Bruce. And remember, Bruce had been doing this for a long time. He's only 25 years old at this point. But he'd been doing this for a long time, really 24 when he's recording this. So uh, there's a progression in the songwriting compared to his previous work. There's not nearly as much New Jersey or Jersey stuff in there. He tried to write, uh, what, what did he say here? An attempt to make the songs more identifiable to a wider audience. So more mature. He called Born to Run, quote, the album where I left behind my adolescent definitions of love and freedom. It was the dividing line. Now, in that, he had a lot more studio time, as I mentioned. It took him six months to record the song Born to Run and 14 months to record this album. Uh, he said he, he battled with anger and frustration over the album, saying he heard, quote, sounds in his head that he could not explain to the others in the studio. Now, the album's known because it has long introductions to most of the songs, and he also tried to create a wall of sound, uh, Phil Spector type of sound on here. He said he wanted Born to Run to sound like Roy Orbison singing Bob Dylan produced by Phil Spector. So that is quite the aspiration. I think he exceeded that and made it all his own. Now, he said he wanted to make the greatest rock album ever, the greatest guitar-driven rock album ever, but he said the irony was he composed all of these on a piano, so you're going to see a lot of piano stuff in here. So you're going to see the, the traditional E Street band. A lot of them are now with us, the guys that we know and we still know to this day when I'm filming this in 2023. So here we go. Number eight, we got Night. It's propelled by Gary Talent's bass. It's similar to the album's title track, and both songs deal with men and their fast cars. And he's just going to continue on this on the next album, Darkness on the Edge of Town. It mostly describes a central character as a blue-collar worker who, after working a full day, runs into the night to go drag racing and search for the love of a woman. Very similar to a few songs on Darkness on the Edge of Town, the next album. The desperation and darkness of the lyrics make a stark contrast to the rest of the album, which I think is much more upbeat and glorifies the nightlife. This one almost is a, is a sadder tune in that aspect, not in the arrangement, but in the lyrics. So that's number eight. Then it just starts to get tough, man. I, number seven, I'm going to have She's the One. I think a lot of people have that higher, but it's about a very attractive but cold-hearted woman. I've known a few of those in my life, right? And although the singer knows she's a liar, he wants to believe her, even though he knows it's going to cause her more, him more pain. He's going to stay with her. He doesn't care. Uh, like 10th Avenue Freeze Out and Night, which we just covered, the story of the relationships told in a flashback. It's not current time. He's reminiscing about it. Rhythm reminiscent of Bo Diddley beat. He's claimed he wrote the song primarily because he wanted to hear Clarence play its sax solo, which is at the end and is so fantastic. So I can see that. Next up at number six, we got Meeting Across the River, which I know a lot of people uh, would have as the worst song on here, but I actually it's grown on me over the years. It's a dark character sketch featuring a soft, haunting trumpet played by Randy Brecker. Piano backing from the great Roy Baton, who's just fantastic on this album, everywhere. Upright bass from jazz veteran Richard Davis. And Brecker's jazz-inspired horn like adds this cinematic feel to it. You really do feel like you're a movie. And the song itself, you got this guy who's down on his luck. Him and his friend Eddie are going to meet a guy across the river, right, for some sort of criminal thing. 
He's desperate. He needs to borrow money and get a ride from Eddie. And his girlfriend's threatening to leave because he pawned her radio, which back then radios were uh, 1974, 1975. Radios were valuable things. You had to have them around, right? Now we get to the top five. And then I'm going to tell you something right now. The top five of this album has got to be about as difficult as ranking the top five on any album. Here we go. 10th Avenue Freeze Out. It was released as a single. There were only two singles off this album. It only went to number 83, though. Tells the story of the E Street Band formation. Some of it fictional, some of it not fictional. It talks about Bad Scooter, which is just a pseudonym for him. B.S., right? Bad Scooter, Bruce Springsteen. All the adventures they go through. The third verse, the big man joined the band. Of course, those of you who love Bruce know it's Clarence Clemens. Uh, there's three saxes on this. There's a trumpet. There's a bugle. There's a trombone. It's just a great jam. The horns are fantastic. It's just all just such a great jam. Roy's piano playing is tremendous. And yet somehow this doesn't even land in the top half of this album, which is going to tell you how uh, how insane this album really is. All right, top four. And I know a lot of people would flip-flop what I just had, 10th Avenue Freeze out in this one, but we got Backstreet. Got that long minute-plus instrumental intro by Roy Baton, where he's on the organ and the piano kind of mixed in. You can hear a few other instruments at times. Now, what this song is about, some people said, is say, because it's Terry, T E R R Y. So, some people say it's about a homosexual relationship with a man, some of it is a platonic relationship with a man. But the bootleg versions of Backstreets from the 1978 Darkness Tour, Darkness on the Edge of Town, of course, his next album. Terry is re repeatedly referred to as she and little girl, indicating that Terry is indeed a woman. So boys and girls, the conspiracy theories can end. In his autobiography, Springsteen states that Backstreet's is about a broken friendship. So I don't know, man, but I mean, this song, it's over six minutes long and it's just screaming on the back streets. Oh my goodness. Okay, here we go. Top three. I don't know, man. I don't know. I, I, I didn't struggle with this greatly, but it's, it's a struggle. Because you could flip these songs in any order and you would not be wrong. Uh, number three, I'm going with Jungle Land, the album closer. I mean, just absolutely unbelievable. Talks about the street life. Our guy Rat, with occasional relay, uh, references to the gang's conflict with police. The end of it, Rat's going to get gunned down and his relationship with the barefoot girl is going to come to an end. And the final fallout of him dying is guess what? No one cares because Bruce says no one watches as the ambulance pulls away. As the girl shuts out the bedroom light. Man, the poets down here don't write nothing at all. They just stand back and let it all be. So Rat is dead. Now Clarence's sax solo on here is next level, right? It's unbelievable. Probably his best work ever. Here's the thing. It took him 16 hours to lay down. Bruce just kept making him do it over and over again because Bruce was more than dialed in in the studio. He always is. But, you know, remember, he's, uh, he's recording for his livelihood here. Uh, Clarence said all we could do was hold on. Smoke a lot of pot and try to stay calm. And Bruce just kept making him do it over and over and over again. And he took different versions of it and just mixed them all together on that sax solo, which makes it even crazier. Number three, Jungle Land. You could have it at number one. I get it. Now the top two songs. Hmm. Uh, this is probably my favorite song, but it's not the best song, if that makes sense on here. And I try to go, I try to really do this objectively, not subjectively. So number two, I got Thunder Road. In this, Bruce is trying to convince Mary to come to him and leave town, right? They're going to get out of here. In 2005, VH1 Storytellers interview, Bruce shared that this is more than an invitation to the album because it leads off the album. It's an invitation to a bigger life. He said, quote, the music sounds like an invitation. Something's opening up to you. What I hoped is it would, it would be when I wrote this song is what I got out of rock and roll music, which is a sense of a larger life, greater experience, Hopefully more and better sex, a sense of fun, more fun, a sense of personal exploration, your possibilities, the idea that it's all lying somewhere inside of you, just on the edge of town, which is a little precursor for the next album, Darkness, on the edge of town. The harmonica, the piano, the sax, it's all just done. It's one of, one of his greatest songs. I'm ranking every single one of his songs, and I'm going to have to give him a numerical ranking, right? And I rank this song a 985. I rank Jungle Land a 985. I mean, these are going to be among my top 10 Springsteen songs of all time. These top three songs are. So uh, this Thunder Road, just fantastic. And of course, number one, it's the title track, Born to Run Single. Went to 23, his first top 40 single. So at least he was getting in there. And of course, this is written in the first person. It's a love letter to Wendy, of course. He wants her to go with him, but he's not much patience with her, but he does want her to go with him. Now, Bruce had uh, said, 
It a, has a much simpler core, getting out of Freehold, New Jersey. U.S. Route 9 is a highway passing through Freehold. It's mentioned from the lyrics, sprung from cages out of Highway 9. Danny Federici's glockenspiel on here adds this nice tone to this song. Remember, I told you at the start, this took over six months to, to get done. So, Bruce, this is the first song you did here. He just toils over the song, and then it just goes away, right? As he's got to finish the rest of the album almost you know, a year later. So, uh, fantastic. I rated a 10, a perfect song. And if you watch this channel, you know I don't rate anything at 10. Um, but wow. So let me know, guys, what you think of my rankings below. Uh, we can argue about those top three. We can, you know, I mean, I get it, man. There's no wrong answer on this album. It's one of the greatest albums of all time, bar none. So let me know what you think of it down below. Uh, be on the lookout. Darkness on the Edge of Town. I think maybe the most underrated album in Bruce's entire discography is up next. If, if you haven't already, give me a big thumbs up. Hit that big red subscribe button. It greatly helps us out. Check out the playlist below. I got a Springsteen when we got all our Springsteen albums that we've done. And also the discography rankings. I'll keep adding as I go through this. Until next time, guys, I will see you.